service, a mass exodus for all of you that are working in the church, but to give you some tools to help you avoid getting to where we got to and to help you if you are finding yourself in this place to find help. And that's my sole purpose today is not to destroy ministry. It's not ministry that destroyed me. It was me that destroyed me while I was doing mothering and working full time and pastoring a church full time with my husband. So it was just things I didn't do quite right. And it took a toll on us. So that's what I want to share with you today. And I've I've titled this Breaking the Cycle. And when I started praying about, my husband and I really want to speak about this just to help people not to get in a predicament where we found ourselves. And we've been writing things and documents and trying to get this all together. And one of the things that the Lord just kept saying to me and one of the things I did eventually learn is that we have to break the cycle. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, later on. But one of the things that, um, like I said, God just kept bringing this up to me, was breaking the cycle. We have to learn to do something different. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So um, my little road map, uh, if you can see up here, is... I'm going to talk to you about my story. I'm going to get into that here in just a minute. And um, what I've learned. Then I want to give you some tools, how to break that cycle. And then let's let God. How about that? We do that together, okay? Let's pray this morning. Father, I just come before you right now. Father, it's all you and not me. I, I submit to you as your servant, Father. And I pray, God, that you would just anoint what we go through in this next, uh, say, 50 minutes or so, Father. And I just pray that every ear that is here will hear what they need to hear, will process what they need to process in you, and will fix what they need to fix, and then realize this is all because you want them healed, Father. So I yield to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And it's warmer in here than I had anticipated. So if I shed my jacket here in a bit, you'll know why. It's just that I'm over 50-some years old, and you can only handle the heat so long, right? Uh, But you got to look good too, right? So So I'm going to kind of freelance off of my notes here for this section and just tell you and get real with you about my story. And about um, probably be about three years ago now, we had been, uh, it was kind of around Easter time 2019, so pre-COVID. Let's imagine what life was like. We weren't restricted by anything. We're running at warp nine where the streets are full of cars and all that kind of stuff and crowded everywhere we go. And life was just clipping along and clipping along. And uh, we became inter- empty nesters about 10 years ago. And one thing we did when we were empty nesters, instead of saying, let's travel more, because I was still working full time. My husband worked part time at another job. Plus, we both worked at the church, him full time and me 20 some hours a week. I was the worship pastor there. And anything else they needed, a woman's director, all of that, and trying to keep all that up. Well, when we became empty nesters, we did not pull back. We dove in even more because we were like, I don't have sports to take my kids to. I don't have all these other things. And we're servants of God, so we're going to just do more. And that's exactly what we began doing about 10 years ago. So um, one of the things, though, back around Easter... Unbeknownst to me at the time, my husband was dismissing Easter Sunday service. And he stepped down a couple steps like he normally did, and he was um, telling everybody, you know, God bless you, have a good week, whatever, doing his normal thing. And he said, God spoke to him plain as day and said, This is your last Sunday, Easter Sunday, at Valley View. And I was like, But I didn't know this, folks, for two more weeks. We were very tired. We, were, we had just come back in October from a conference, felt very refreshed, diving back in, you know, just doing everything to keep ourselves going. 
and here it is Easter, and everybody's prepping for Easter now, right? All of the churches, and you, it's busy. It's a lot to do, a lot of things, a lot of last minute, and then you're hosting your whole community on Easter Sunday, however many services you have, and it takes a couple weeks to recuperate after Easter's over, and so we were pretty much laying low for a couple weeks, and um, about two weeks later, my husband came to me, and he said, okay, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you about something God spoke to me. And I'm just sitting there. I might have been on my phone. I don't know. The TV was on for noise. And, and he's behind me in the kitchen, and I'm in the den. And I said, okay, what? <laughs> like, I'm not really thinking anything big is coming. And he said, God spoke to me and said that we would be leaving Valley View. And I said, what? You know, kind of, where'd that come from? You know, he's always said from the pulpit, I'll be here forever, you know. And I'm like, so this was news to me too. But honestly, in my heart of hearts, I, I was thinking we were, something was going to be happening. I just didn't know what and when. And so when he said that, I just blurted out. He said, I think we need to go on a sabbatical for about two months. And I said, well, how about a year? And he went, really? Are you thinking a year? Like I had heard from God. And I was like, no, I just said that. And, and he goes, I think we need a year. And I'm like, okay, you need to come sit down and we need to really talk about this. And so we began praying, fasting. And I just have to make a quick little disclaimer. My Valley View family is over here and I appreciate them very much. Give them a hand. And this is the first time they're hearing this side of the story because we couldn't then tell you why we were leaving. We had no clue what the journey was going to start at that point. So thank you for being gracious. <laughs> so when we began praying, we called several people that we trusted in God and we're praying, we're reading, we were like this, you know, and then at times get super scared because that was um, my husband's full-time income, and we had a lot, you know, we're, we're, we're screaming into retirement age, and we've got a lot of things to think about, and you can't just cut and run, and of course our heart's desire, as I made clear in my bio <laughs> to Clarissa, is that um, if I'm not going to be here, I'm going to be in Bismarck where my kids and my grandkids are. That's my desire. I don't know if that's God's desire. It hasn't proven to be that yet for my life, but that's where I would rather be if I'm not here. And so as we began to go through that process, this was probably early May because Easter was in April that year. And we, some friends of ours were kind of going through the same thing, but they were further along in this process. And she recommended a book to me and Mark, and she said, it's called Before You Move, A Guide to Making Transitions in Ministry. And that book is by John R. Sianka. And if you want anything, I can give it to you afterwards if you didn't get that. But basically, this book is a lot of years. He's tweaked the book over the years. He explains in each chapter some self-examination tools and setting the table straight. And you're not leaving because you're just tired or you're angry with somebody. or you're the, it's, not, it's not meant to be something, if you want something to prove to you, you you're justified to leave. It is not that kind of a book. It's a book that is pretty convicting because you have to do, you think you're going to whip through all these questions and this guide to give you a graph at the end, when in actuality we had to stop middle of the chapter and pray, and we had to seek, you know, God for, why am I thinking this way, or why, you know, I mean, he really challenges you so that you don't, I mean, it's almost like he gives you the opportunity to shake and rattle every single door before you make a decision. And each chapter has um, a series of questions. And he goes through this concept of however many questions when you get to the end, they're red lights, they're yellow lights, or they're green lights. Red light means no, you 
stop, you're not leaving. Yellow means some caution and maybe you can correct the course of your path. And green light means it's time to go. As if, mind you, God hadn't already spoke to my husband that it was time. And so going through the book, ironically, we both did our own test and both of us almost exactly matched each of our answers, independent of each other, and was over 95% green light go through all of the story of this book. And so that just kind of made a confirmation to us. It, it didn't mean like we just immediately, this is still May, we didn't leave till August. There was a lot of soul searching and a lot of talking and prayer. And we made the decision probably around the end of May. Actually, it was a little before that because it was before Mother's Day that we had made the decision we were going to start down that trajectory. But we had a couple big things coming up at the church and we weren't going to leave till after that time had happened. So we had camp meeting. We were the host church for camp meeting in early June. And we had our kids camp remember kids camp um, in the summer and that was July I think so we had picked a date early August which actually we didn't realize till after we had left was exactly to the day 15 years that we had been at Valley View and so through that whole process we made the decision and it camp meeting uh, Dr. David Ramirez from uh, the council came out and he spoke uh, he was the speaker at our um, camp meeting. And one of the nights, uh, he had all the pastors down front and was praying over them. And when he got to Mark and I, what he was praying for us was pretty general, but very much kind of confirming the path that we were on. And he started to walk away, and he paused, and he turned back around, and he put his hand towards my husband, and he said, push the door, it's open. And he walked away. Well, I just lost it at that point. He was lost it. But we couldn't say anything or do anything publicly like, praise God, he answered our prayer, or oh my gosh, now it's real kind of thing. Either way, we couldn't have done that that night. So we waited till we got home after we cleaned up the church and we got everything ready for the next day and we get home and we're like, wow, what did you take from that? He goes, I think we're going. And I said, okay. So we had made that decision and... You know, it's hard keeping a secret from people you love. And um, we had, at that point, talked to our children and let them know what was going on. And I say all that to tell the story is that sometimes when a pastor or a leader in your life leaves, it's not always they're just being mean and chucking. There's a lot of agony and a lot of prayer and a lot of things that go into consider following what God's leading you to do in your life. So... Um, I'm asking for grace. <laughs> so anyway, um, we did make the announcement, and God, again, in his great mercy, showed us that he was with us. And actually, Desiree, one of our, uh, she was our, our youth pastor at the time, um, thought that after we told them, we told our staff the night before we told the church, which was two weeks before we left, that um, on the night before our last Sunday was to take place, our grandson, Cade, of which I told you about at the beginning, was um, born early. He came about three weeks early. So um, we had a little bit of excitement to hold on to in facing a very difficult announcement to make to our church that next morning. So God just was gracious and was with us each and every step along the way and gave us hope and was with us. Matter of fact, um, we had the Indian church was meeting in our other building and between our church when we left and the Indian church, they gave us a month's salary total when we left because, you know, when you leave one job and go to another, before you get all your check in, in that you, you could starve to death before the first full check comes, right? So they blessed us beyond what we could imagine, uh, sent us on our journey. Um, there were a lot of tears, but it seemed that everybody understood. We didn't know why, and we didn't know what was ahead. And that's when we began to realize that 
just quitting something and resting wasn't enough. And about three months later, um, I was in a leadership group at work, and they had hired this company to come in and have us, we were, uh, they were going to do uh, career counseling to kind of up your game a little bit. And so I was like, yeah, I'm in, you know. Little did I realize I was not ready for this. I didn't know what was about to happen to me. And when we went through all the counseling, they sent out all these surveys to your boss, all the people that were above you, all the people that were below you, and all your peers lateral, not just in your office, but other divisions throughout the city. Total evaluation from your personality, your kindness, your work ethic, your ability to do your job, everything. No holds barred. And it was very intensive. The results were 10 pages. And you saw the chart with all the people that did participate and what they rated you at in every category. I'm happy to say I got a 98%. That's great. You clap now. I get my chance to sit down with the counselors to give me guidance. And I am instantly freaking out about the 2% that didn't like me or didn't evaluate me. I'm like, who doesn't like me? I'll go fix it. That's my whole goal. And I'm sitting there in this, there's this lady that was about my age as the lead counselor, and they were, had a counselor in training. Very young, nice young lady. And they're sitting there going over it, and they're not saying anything bad, really. And even if I was to tweak something, they're like, ah, oh, just pay attention to this little thing, or maybe you could do this or something. I immediately start to bawl uncontrollably, shaking, crying. I did not wear waterproof mascara that day, and I kept trying, because I'm at work. There's a Debbie at work that has to look a certain way, right, and be in control. And this is my whole problem, is I've got to have everything in control. And I am bawling, shaking, trying to dab my eyes. And when you're crying that much, dabbing your eyes, you get a soaking tissue. And I'm hunting for more tissue. We're in a conference room that is for uh, the public, not for back office people where you got your coffee maker and your candy and all those things. There is nothing in this room. And I am bawling. And I'm, I'm unconsolable. And there, I, I do happen to look up, and they're looking at me like, you know, like, what, 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 what did we say? And even God was in that room. I had two spirit-filled ladies, born-again Christians, in that room with me because they stand up to me, and they say, hey, look, because I'm, I'm apparently blubbering. I just stepped out of ministry. I think I'm tired. I, and then someone doesn't like my work. And, and whatever I'm mumbling out, and they heard enough to identify, okay, sister, we're with you. We're saved. I used, the older lady said, I used to be director of women at a 30,000-member church in California. I know where you are coming from. And I'm like, okay, because I don't. I'm sitting there, I'm, and in my mind, I'm rationalizing enough that I know 98% approval from everybody across the board is great, but I want the number of that person who knocked 2% off, right? That's all I'm focusing on. And generally, that is not my nature. But here I am finding myself in my public career going, Nobody has ever seen me cry, let alone almost like nervous breakdown. Here I am, a blubbering mess. And we had been three months out of pastoring the uh, lead pastor role. Stepping aside and just doing less is not healing, and it is not rest. It's just lack of extra duty, right? I was about to learn this, and 
what the Lord began to do after that day was a journey of healing. And one thing before I finish that part of the story, the young counselor in training said, Debbie, have you ever boated before? I said, yeah, I grew up with a family that went out on Lake Mead all the time. And she's like, okay, so you'll understand this analogy. When you need to make change in your life, you do it a very little increment at a time. Because in boating, you make little degrees of change. Or you, if you drive it like you drive a car, you can capsize your boat. It's too much movement. And so she cautioned me, if you take, if you're on a boat around the world, and you want to go, say, that's somewhere in Asia, um, say you want to go to uh, China. And she said, if you get off course one degree, you will end up, instead of this way, you will end up this way. So she said, be careful to stay on course and make change incrementally. That's good, right? I didn't realize how true that would be. And so what I want to talk about now is I went home to my husband and I told him what happened that day. Him and I, we share everything. Even when I make a big mistake and I, I hate sin, but I fall into it, and then he helps pick me back up, put me on, and I do the same for him. But I get home that day after being a mess. I did have a friend, I do want to say this, who did come to me after that meeting as if that wasn't bad enough the same day she were sitting in one of the city vehicles and coming back from another meeting and she said can I talk to you about something and I was like and her and I were we're good work friends and outside of work friends she said I don't know how any way to say this she goes but you're mean you've gotten very mean and short-tempered and she said I can't take it anymore. I did not realize. I guess I thought when I would respond to people, oh, I probably shouldn't have been, that sounded kind of like I bit her head off or something. I was seeing some things, but I didn't ca even capture the weight of what, how I was reacting to people. We spent an hour in that car crying again. I'm crying at work, and I don't do those kinds of things. I, what I want you to see is a pattern here that I'm having very abnormal behavior for myself. These were the road signs. These were things that I should have noticed. But people, thank God, were pointing it out to me, even the 2% that I got so upset about, right? So we reconciled. I went home. I apologized to my husband because I assumed if I was doing it at work, I was treating my husband badly at home because at home we're always worse, right? We, we keep our good public self out there. We have no problems, right, out in public. But at home, everything can be falling apart. So I apologized to him. And him being a counselor himself said, I think we need to get some help. Just resting is not enough. And that began our journey. We had heard that the Church of God gives ministers free counseling and to their families. So here we are moving closer to 2020 at the end of 2019, and we're contacting them about how we can go about coming and get some free counseling. And you have to go to Tennessee. They'll put you up and they'll give you the free counseling, but you have to get there. And we just didn't have the money coming through a job transition and taking a huge cut in pay when we left, that um, they were experimenting with Zoom and would like give us the opportunity to become virtually counseled. And so prior to COVID hitting three months later, we were already in virtual counseling. So when COVID hit, our counseling kept going. So we were good. God set us up before it ever was to start. So what I want to go to is this emotional cup slide next. And um, this, in my first counseling session, I don't know how Dr. Manis made um, sense of what I said because I was still at that blubbering state. 
And he said, Debbie, I'm gonna tell you right now, your emotional cup is full. And that is why you're having all of these emotional outbursts over what appears to be this 98% approval rating. And everything else in your life is good. Our kids were doing good. I'm a grandparent now, I, all this. He goes, your emotional cup is full. And what happens is, and we've learned this since we've been in some peer counseling training and stuff as well, is anything bad that's happened to you, any, any kind of big deal and you shove the emotions aside and you keep moving, again, that facade out in public, I gotta look like I got it all together. And especially as pastor's wives, we can't look like we're hurting or struggling with something. And so, that emotional cup, as you can see, anger and bitterness, uh, true guilt, retaliation, false guilt. I'm gonna to talk to you about that too. Condemnation, fears, insecurity, stress and anxiety. My cup was full. I had been spending 35 plus years in ministry, working full time and ministry and raising a family. Same with my husband with no boundaries, with no protection measures, and my cup could not hold any more. And that was why I was having all of these emotional outbursts um, and biting people's heads off and being angry with people is because I kept shoving things into this cup or as a lot of first responders call it, we shove it in a box all the bad things that we've seen and things that we've had to deal with that the rest of the world will, thank God, never have to see. And so we shove these things aside, and at some point, where you're shoving them and putting them gets full. And out of it comes your moods. You escape, some can escape into work. We did that at times too. We, uh, we didn't do drugs, thank you Jesus, or alcohol, or pornography, or any of that. God spared us from all that kind of stuff. Loss of energy and concentration. I couldn't put two words together some days. I was just, I, I couldn't find the word in my vocabulary to use it. Uh, sleep and appetite disturbances. I obviously didn't stop eating, but my sleep cycles, they suffered and um, loss of emotions like joy, love, affection, and romance, and impatience, quick temper. I wanted everything to happen fast. I don't have time to wait around for this. All of those kinds of emotions begin to erupt out of a full cup because, and when another yet crisis would come up or thing would happen, I had no place for it. I had no room for it, and I would spin out of control. And this is where my first couple sessions was spent here with this emotional cup. Um, my cup was full because I was snapping at people at work. I didn't want to be around people. I was super emotional, hypersensitive. Little things would push me over. Lack of interest in things I used to love. I was a worship leader. From the time I got saved at five years old, I played church not just played house as a little girl. I'd put all of my stuffed animals out. I would sing to them. I would preach to them. And as my mom, I've told this story before, <clears throat> I can sing Old Rugged Cross and peel the paint off the walls because I know it so well. I've worked out so many renditions because that's the song I used to sing to my stuffed animal congregation. I love church. I love God, and I wanted to serve God. I was called at 12 years old to full-time ministry. This was my passion, this was my thing. It didn't realize itself because I'll guarantee you my five to 10 year old self singing the old rugged cross in my mind how I heard it was not how my mother and brother and dad interpreted it when I, they would throw things at me and yell at me, say stop singing that song, you know? So this was my passion. And when we left Valley View, first of all, I didn't have enough breath to pray. I certainly had no desire to sing and play my piano. And I moved my piano out to where it was accessible and got it out of the way. I just, it, it was something I could not deal with at that time. And 
All of that to be said, six months ago, I moved my piano back in my front room and I've started playing the piano and singing again and praying out loud and talking. I did that sooner, but that was a sign to me that healing was taking its place, amen? So I want to go into four areas that what I learned, and I learned with the help of a counselor that Mark and I, my husband and I, because we went through it together. We did no individual counseling. We did it together because I'll back up. Our marriage was close to snuff. Now we don't, In our vocabulary, is not divorce, and that would have never happened, but we were never going to experience joy and intimacy again if we didn't get something changed in what was going on. We were fried. We had nothing to give each other, and we had nothing to give anybody else at this point. We were needing help. So we chose, at the guidance of Dr. Manis, our counselor, that we would do it together because all of these things were tied to us together. We've done everything together in ministry. We needed to clean it up together and heal together. So we decided to go on this journey together. And after our hour sessions, we spent hours and days during the week crying and praying and asking each other forgiveness and talking about scenarios of what we could have done better and how we could have reacted better and all those kinds of things that go through a healing process. First thing we learned, number one, is it's okay to say no. And I want to clarify that with a statement in Dr. Henry Cloud's book, his book on boundaries. I needed to learn when to say yes how to say no, and to take healthy control of my life. It's not just learning how to say no, but there's a right time and a right place to do things. And one of the things we learned was that when you're in this crisis mode and you're a leader and you feel like you can't control everything, guess what you do? You sign up to lead everything you're involved in so you can have control, right? So you're already over-tasked with leading things, but in order for you to maintain control, you grab everything else you're doing. You can't just be a part of it. You have to be in charge of it. So what did we do? We kept amassing more that we had to be. And my people can laugh at me. I know you see us. We were running around sometimes as we're, we're going to do this. Oh, we are? And we're going to do this, you know. And then we'll run it. And so we needed to set some good, healthy boundaries. And just because we are in ministry, this is a very popular verse that we all quote when we're trying to push through something. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But those of us in ministry, we're very good at reading it this way. I must do all things for Christ that strengthens me. That's the only way I'm going to get strength is I must do everything for God. Did you hear how I misinterpreted that? And (laughs) Dr. Manis pointed that out, and it hit us like a two-by-four. It's never been a command. It was about Paul's contentment. The verses before it talk about him saying, I've had it all. I've had wealth. I've had rags and riches. I've had lots in my belly and comforted, and I've been starving. But through it all, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Come on, go ahead, give the Lord a hand clap because it was about his contentment. It never was something, a command to push us to do more and more and more and more. And that, God confirmed that to us one night. In our first year, we were kind of 
bouncing around looking at other churches since we've only been in our church. We wanted to see what other people were doing and kind of pick up some education along the way. And we end up at Red Rocks Church right in our neighborhood, actually. Um, the first Sunday after January, I think it was 2020. And we can barely get a, a, a parking space, take the shuttle across the street from the mall. We get in, we find two seats, and we're sitting there, and everybody is all abuzz. And I just said, gosh, is this just because it's the first Sunday after the first of the year, everybody's New Year's resolutions, and what we're all we're doing is everybody's trying to go back to church, like get healthy spiritually and physically. And this lady turns around, and she goes, oh, no. The pastor's, this is his first Sunday back since he had a nervous breakdown six months ago. And I went, oh, great. I don't, I'm hurting. I don't really need to be and listen to someone else's story right now. And Mark and I look at each other. We're like, um, okay, let's see what he says. And he comes to this same realization through some counseling that we've always taken this verse out of context. And so God's continually confirming to us, I got to let that go. I have to change my thinking on that verse. That First of all, God's not angry for us being in a sabbatical and going through counseling. And he's not angry at us because I couldn't do everything. And I had to come face to face. My husband and I came face to face with that. And along with that, in this same kind of environment, um, uh, we just had to look at it through eyes of contentment instead of this command. I was going to say something else, but it's in my next section, so I'm going to wait because it's better poised there. That's where my mind paused for a second. So we had to learn how to say no, and we had to learn that that command or that scripture was not our command. It was our contentment. And little by little, like remember I said with the boat, you make one little incremental change. We worked on that together through prayer. I journaled all the way through what our emotions were. I've been reading that in preparation. I went back and read it. And I'm like, wow, I do remember those days. I'm not that person now. And that was a good roadmap to see. So we journaled all the way through that. Or I journaled for us. He doesn't like to journal. But I journaled for us because it's a good roadmap, right? So number two, it is okay to ask for help. In whatever you're going through, whether it's as big as a nervous breakdown or it's trouble with a spouse or uh, a parent or something, it's okay to ask somebody for help. Seek your counsel well and seek godly counsel. And then don't always just take their word for it. Take it and pray about it and ask God to lead your steps. And he will. And so this is how we ended up with our counselor. Um, and what he basically ended up doing was pointing out things we couldn't see, my emotional cup. I had no idea that's what was going on with me. And help, what I call is like pulling the weeds out of our garden of our life. He could see things on the outside. He spoke things into my husband's life. And I won't tell his side of the story. Someday he'll tell his story. But there were things that he had to recognize too. And in an ever so gentle way, the Holy Spirit just, it wasn't like we were sitting there getting beat with a whip. It was gentle. It was, all we needed was the information because once you give me the information, then I know what to do with it. And that's what I'm kind of hoping to do is just give you the information today and you apply it where it needs to be today. Or you may know somebody going through something and it'll give you the freedom to help start that process with somebody, at least have a conversation. We had gotten to where we were, we're great friends. We just did everything together. We can live together fine in harmony and that, but we quit talking to each other. My husband did it because he didn't want to burden me with more stuff, was his reasoning. And I was hungry for him to talk to me and he wouldn't talk to me so I thought he didn't love me anymore. We were in a bad place, but we did not not love each other anymore. We loved each other. We just didn't know how to get 
back to each other. And Dr. Manis helped us picking through these weeds to find our relationship again. Amen? <clears throat> We're happy that God healed that in us too. Number three, one of the harder things for us to realize, and this was about three months in, and mind you, out of these four categories, we took one of these a month and really just wrestled them down. Number three was you can't want it more than they want it. And when I said that to my daughter, she goes, what does that mean? To me, it means, makes perfect sense, but I'm going to explain it to you. When you're, especially in ministry, trying to invest in people's lives, you pour into them, you counsel with them, you go to bat for them, sometimes you stand in court with them, sometimes you, you give them money, sometimes whatever. You are giving of yourself to them, and they seem to, oh, I want this, I want this, and then they don't follow through with it. What am I left with? My expectation was let down. But I had high hopes for them. And as pastor's wives and people in ministry and t teachers and everybody that's investing and parents, it happens to us parents as well, is we invest in everybody and we, we've got the confidence that they're going to make it and we keep pouring into them and when they don't, we become disappointed, we cry, we're, we get angry, you know, because you were so close or you did it, you did it, and then you, it's almost like sometimes even, and you'll see this in some people's lives, not everybody, but they, re, they get it and they get everything handed to them and it's working out and God has majorly blessed them. And like a dog, they return to their vomit. And you're, they're back living in squalor and, and problems galore. And we wanted their change and their growth way more than they wanted it. And we needed to let ourselves off the hook. And that's painful to hear because we're always gonna be encouragers and parents. And, and I just talked to a lady last week and she was all distraught that her adult son seemed to be turning away from what she raised him in church. And I said, just be careful not to want their relationship more than they want it or you will drive them away. Because what happens is you start meddling in their business because you're like, it's looking like I'm failing because I'm investing in them and when I fail, I, I don't like to fail. So let's, I'm gonna, and you start, you get angry with them and you get really ugly stern, not godly stern, but you get ugly stern, right? And so, Years and years and years of this, you, again, that emotional cup gets full and you don't got nothing but anger left. I don't have heartfelt, hardly anything left. I have, okay, I don't want you to fail again, so let's do this. Let's, and I can't tell you how many people I regrouped with and I regrouped with and I regrouped with and I restarted with. And I had to let them go never stopped praying for them, never stopped hoping it would work out, but I had to let myself off the hook because they didn't want it yet. But can I tell you this one thing? More than you want it, God wants it for them. Amen? And because God wants it more than you, he will hold no uh, stop in place. He will pull everything out of the way to woo that person to him in his time, not my time, right? Including your kids. So I'm just throwing that out as free groceries. If you are a parent and you're struggling with kids that don't seem to want to come to church or even care about God, keep praying for them. Stay on them in prayer. Don't stay on them in their business about God. But just remind them how much they're loved by you and by God. And that's, it. God will, if God wooed you, he's going to woo your kids. Amen? If he can get you, he can get them. He's big enough. Let him do it. Amen? 
So in this area that I can't want it more than they want it, this term, false guilt, came to light. And that's where I was carrying the weight of what everybody hadn't achieved to in my life that I thought, I've got to get them there. I'm their pastor. I have got to get them there. I'm responsible. I'm not responsible. I'm responsible to teach and preach and lead, but I can't make you make a decision. And I had to let myself off the hook. Hey Amen. That's big. And that doesn't happen overnight. And I'll give you a quick tool. In my journaling, I had to write down, and Dr. Manis said to me, he was, it's funny because when you're in couples counseling, Dr. Manis is dealing with something with my husband and my mind kind of wanders off. I'm like, okay, he's going to get the heat for a while. I'm going to sit here and like, I'm, I'm going to recover. I'm good. I don't got, nothing in this lesson's going to hit me. And then he goes, and now Debbie. <laughs> I went, <laughs> he goes, are you a journaler? I said, yes, sir, I am. He goes, okay, I want you to start journaling names of people your whole life that have disappointed you or hurt you. And I was like, no. Can we go back to Mark and finish? I like what you were telling him to do. So I had to journal. You write it down, write these names down, and you start praying that God bring you to a place that you can forgive them. That is the only thing that's going to get rid of the hurt. And hurt is the root of 99% of all anger. Write that down. Hurt is the, it's a direct result or the fruit of anger. If you're snapping at people and you're angry all the time and you wake up angry and you go to bed angry and you wake up the next day angrier, somebody has hurt you somewhere along the way and you need to deal with it. You need to write it down. You need to pray. Because I'm going to guarantee you, forgiveness doesn't always happen immediately. We can push those words out of our mouth. But that means nothing until our heart says it. And if you've got areas, even in your family life with relationships, forgiveness doesn't release them. It releases you and your mind because you are staying the prisoner if you don't forgive them. God will take care of what needs to be taken care of in your other people. Boundaries, yes. Forgiveness, yes, all the more. Doesn't mean you let them waltz back in, but you need to forgive them, okay? And that was easier said than done. And um, sometimes God will still bring up something and he'll go, you need to forgive them for that. We're going through the bait of Satan at Life Chapel right now. And there was a cute video they showed about what an offense is. And at the end, the guy's carrying a fence and he goes, you're, a, you're on a fence. And so all I ever hear when I see I've been offended is I'm the offense, I'm holding a fence. And truthfully, you hold up a fence or a wall with a fence so you've got to deal with it because until you get all that cleaned up, you're never going to heal and move past where you're at. And the fourth thing we learned about that emotional cup is we need to empty that emotional cup. And honestly, it can be done. When you're in this place, you cannot see how you could do that. Once you realize this is the, where you're at, you cannot see where or how you're going to be able to do that. First of all, there is a period of rest, and we did that for about three months where we just were relaxing from not having extra duties. But true rest comes when all the screaming things in life are not holding you back or weighing you down. And if you're driving to work going, I really want to go put my kayak in the lake tonight, but I've got a meeting after work and I can't do it tomorrow. And Sunday we've got this and Saturday. And if that's your whole thought process and there is never time to go do something that you love in your life, you need to rearrange some things in your life. Because 
Your emotional cup gets emptied when you take your mind off of it by doing other things that you love and you feed other parts of your, your brain, your soul, all of that. And I'm not saying this outside of God, ladies. This is stuff that liberated us in our Christian walk. And um, fortunately, we were relatively new grandparents when we were being taught this. And we were like, okay, now we have weekends off. We're going up as often as we can, and we're visiting our grandkids and our kids because they're all in one place, just not where we are. <laughs> so we spent a whole year, almost every month we saw them. It was healing to our soul just to get down, like praying for frog farts, you know, just having recollection of little kids that have no care in the world. We're going to provide everything they need, and they think you're the best thing ever. Because when Yaya and Papa come to town, we go to places Mama and Daddy don't take you. We feed you things they don't want us to feed you. And we buy you things you don't need. So, I mean, we bought their love right now. As, older, as they get older, we'll have to get more creative, right? But that was healing to our soul. It was timing was great. We did that. We do, are avid kayakers, and we started, we bought um, passes to all the parks, and we started putting our kayak back in the water. And we would kayak, and we love to do this, kayak, <coughs> excuse me, out to the middle of the lake. And we turn facing each other in our kayaks and we just sit there and you know what we do we listen to the silence because when you're out there away from shore and all the people on the shoreline it is dead silent and we could just sit there and literally I'm going to show you a technique if you're laying down in your bed at night it resets your nervous system and sometimes it happens naturally but if you lay flat and you take that big, deep yawn or sigh, that's your nervous system resetting. But this is how. When you lay back in your bed, put your hands behind your head, and you look to the 9 o'clock position. And while you're laying there, and you won't, don't make it. Like, I'm trying to look at 9 o'clock, or 3 o'clock, sorry. Um, but that will you'll either get a heavy sigh, a yawn, or just a, a reset breath, and you've reset your nervous system. And when we kayak out to the middle of a lake, we do that. And I'll tell you, I didn't do a whole lot of that, or I don't ever remember a lot of that happening prior to us looking for how to refill ourselves. And I've got to kind of watch my time here. So quickly, um, uh, like I said, I brought my piano in. I started playing my piano again. Uh, those were things that were uh, relaxing to me. Just find what you like to do. Maybe you sew, you crochet. Maybe you like to hang out with your friends. You do book clubs, and you've not done that in a while. Or you've attended a Bible study. Any of those things, get back to doing those things and make time for that. I'm learning now how to still do that as my life is getting busier in the work world. I still have to use these same principles and I don't want to get back to where I was. So it's something you keep practicing, you keep lifestyle changing. To break the cycle, and this is kind of a, a busy slide, but I, I wanted to be able to just put it all in one group. First of all, what is the one voice we all listen to? Anybody know? Reach, research says we listen to our voice the most. So what we tell ourselves, unfortunately, at times is what we believe, and it's good. Sometimes it's not. So we need to positive self-talk. And the Bible talks about this in Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks, so is he. So use the word of God over your life. Use personal pronouns. When you're reading the scripture, use I, me. Put your name in there. Those scriptures, those declarations, the promises of God are for you. And if you're struggling, I know 
with this COVID and work atmospheres have changed, home atmospheres have changed, stress is through the roof, things have changed and I, I got thrust into a new job and it, I found myself in an area going, I've never done this before and I do more of this at my computer. Okay, Jesus, <laughs> I don't know how to do this, but you do. And I need it in an hour. So can we work on this? <laughs> Amen. And that's, I am out loud praying at my desk. I don't care if anybody sees me. And I've never cared what people thought about me as a Christian. And I've always tried to, everybody at work knows I'm a Christian. And if they need something, they come and say, would you pray about this? I mean, so I'm not worried when I sit at my desk. But I'm going to tell you something. When you really tackle your day even with your kids, and one of them's unruly today. And you're like, ah, Jesus, I don't know how I'm going to make it through today. Honestly, I'm going to kill this kid before noon. Sometimes before 9 o'clock. I might have to go to school, pull him out of class, and kill him. <laughs> Jokingly, of course. But we've all been there at some point with somebody in our life. And that just we need to stop and we need to embrace and call God in on our scene. So be your positive talk. Let the word of God be that po positive affirmation. You have a Google app on your phone or something and Google affirmations of God or the, the Psalms, Psalms 91 and 119. Those are great to read over yourself. Um, Secondly, we need to break the cycle. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. I want to keep eating ice cream at nighttime before I go to bed and wake up skinny in the morning. But until I start putting on my tennis shoes, getting out and walking two or three miles a day and quit eating ice cream, I'm not going to lose the weight. Trust me, I've struggled with this my whole entire life and probably till the day I die, but I keep trying. I get up the next day and I try again. Amen? We want different results. We got to do something different for longer than one time. Okay? Um, the gift of worship. And I call it a gift because I truly feel when I enter into the presence of God, it is a gift because everything washes away. It changes the atmosphere in a room, in your life. And God reminds us in Psalms 95, verse 6, to come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. I learned something when I was too tired to pray. I was always praying in my head, but I was too tired to vocalize it. Partly, I was too tired to sing anymore. I was too tired to play my piano. It was too much effort. And to worship God what took an effort. And I was sitting at home. You know, God ushered us right into COVID, and we couldn't go to another church. So everything I, w I was watching church, here's my guilt, my false guilt. I have to tell you this. Sundays are for church. Always have been in my life and always will be. So when COVID hit and I couldn't go physically to church, I felt like I had to watch three services because that's how much time I would have been at church ministering. So I had to fulfill the time commitment. So I watched Stephen Furtick, Brian Merritt. I sometimes watch uh, Family Worship Center. I watched whoever would just kind of like, I was like, I'm going to watch. And I'd, my husband laughed at me. He goes, he goes, you have so much false guilt in your life. And I'm like, it was just me. I was always feeling like I had to spend all this time with God. And so one of the sermons on one of these three, day, three session marathons I was on, he talked about how God needs to hear our voice. He knows our voice. And a song I want to leave with you if you want to write it down is, You Know My Name by Tasha Cobbs. And that... And being a music person, the first note of the piano that played on that song, I hit my knees and the tears started to stream down my face and I began to worship God and he hit me by myself unannounced and we had worship in my house, just me and God and 
He reminded me that he knows my name and that nothing has happened to me that he hasn't been in control of. And holding my hand the whole way, make sure your worship at times finds you in the posture of worship, as he says in Psalms there, on my knees I bow down. I want you to think your strategy is total surrender at that point. And that's why they talk about being prostrate before, prostrate before God. See, I always say that word wrong, sorry. So I said both of them just in case I said it wrong. That's my cover. <laughs> and so we lay ourselves before God because when we get to heaven, that's going to be our posture for quite a while. I, I figure the first million years I'm going to be face down because I'm just going to be worshiping that I finally see Jesus. Amen? And then praying and learning the word of God. Did I skip? Oh, I skipped four. Let go and trust God. This is a big deal. All we have to do is let go. We have to give it to God. Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Jesus himself says, come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What God has called you to, he carries the weight. He never asked you to carry the weight. If he told you to go somewhere, do something, preach something, say something, he bears the weight. You do the preparation and he does the work. And give yourself a break. He's giving you what you need. If he's called you to it, he's going to get you through it. Amen? And then praying the word of God and learning the word of God. He says to write it on our hearts in Psalms 119 so that I might not sin against God. And that's not the only reason we learn scripture, but it's also to declare to the enemy because Jesus used it as his weapon to Satan himself and it applies to us. And we need to call the word of God down on our families, on our children, on our spouses. We need to use it for us because what's the voice we believe? Ours. And when we're renewing our minds in Romans 12, 2, where it says to transform your mind daily, that's reading the word. That's refreshing yourself. That's the only way we can wash the world off of us. Amen? So in closing, I found this um, statement by Charles Spurgeon. Very British and very old English. O oh, unbelief, how strange a marvel thou art. We know not which most to wonder at, the faithfulness of God or the unbelief of his people. He keeps his promises a thousand times, and yet the next trial makes us doubt him. He has never faileth. He is never a dry well. He is never a setting sun or a passing meteor or a melting vapor. And yet... We are as continually vexed with anxieties, molested with suspicions, and disturbed with fears, as if our God was a mirage of the desert. I read that probably four or five months ago, thinking about trials and different things we go through. And sometimes, I find myself doubting God more than believing God. And just as I think about, he's never failed me. Two and a half years now, we have been retired from full-time pastoring. Um, our sabbatical, I guess, is over, so to speak. Uh, but we have been with Carmen and Brian and just came on the first of this year as their teaching pastors. So God is healing us. He's putting us back together and in pieces that we never thought and healthier than we ever thought. Don't think God is not on your side. I would cry myself to sleep at night because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how to talk to my husband about it. And he didn't know how to talk to me about it. Nine times out of 10, 
The only thing between you and getting things corrected in your life is a conversation or seeking help. And I, when I say learning to say no, I don't mean ugly. And I'm sorry, I just saw the time. I'm so sorry. But what I want you to understand is that God is about getting you healed, healthy, and able to tell others about him at all times. And if you feel dry and dusty, there's help. If you feel like you might be heading that route, there's help. Reach out to somebody you trust in God and start the conversation and God will open the doors for you to get healthy. Amen? Thank you. Thank you.